Hello, and welcome to the National Capital Area Chapter of the American Planning Association's 2021 Annual Conference. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Nick Kushner. I serve as at-large board member for the National Capital Chapter of the APA, um, as well as having the honor on serving on this tremendous panel that we have with us today. Uh, so the title of this session is Innovative Capital Planning for Civic Infrastructure and Facilities. Uh, it's worth one CM credit, uh, which can be claimed at the completion of the session and you can follow the link to claim your credit provided in the conference agenda. Uh, the session is being pre-recorded, so there will not be an opportunity for live Q&A. However, if you have questions for any of the panelists, their emails are included at the end of the presentation. Uh, and with that, I'd like to kick it over to Sakina Khan to start our session. Great, thank you, Nick. I wanna welcome um, everyone to the session on innovative capital planning for civic infrastructure and facilities which is brought to you by the DC Office of Planning and the DC Department of Parks and Recreation. Uh, the acronyms are OP and DPR, and we'll be using those throughout the, uh, throughout the presentation. And I'd also like to thank NCAC APA uh, for the opportunity to, um, to hold this panel. So uh, before we get started, I do wanna do a quick round of introductions. Um, so again, I'm Sakina Khan, and I serve as the Deputy Director for Citywide Strategy and Analysis at the DC Office of Planning. I oversee systems planning for housing, infrastructure, sustainability, transportation, and economic development, as well as the district state data center and geographic information systems. As part of this, I guide large-scale complex projects that rely on data, spatial, and policy analysis, including the comprehensive plan. Rogelio Flores uh, serves as OP's Associate Director for Citywide Planning. He leads strategy and long range planning for the agency. He cultivates collaborations that integrate land use, comprehensive planning and capital facilities. And he also brings 20 years of experience, um, including from Los Angeles, New York and Boston, in addition to DC. And he has been AICP certified since 2013. Nick Kishner, who you heard from at the very beginning, is a community planner at the District Department of Parks and Recreation, and he is the project manager of DPR's 20-year uh, Parks and Recreation Master Plan and Ready to Play. In his role at DPR, Nick collaborates on numerous interagency planning efforts and area plans, manages DPR's GIS inventory, and works closely on DPR's 100-plus capital projects providing planning analysis to inform budget justifications and project scope. He also manages the District's Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is a federal grant program providing up to $2 million annually for outdoor recreation. Last but not least, Jordan Ch Chaffetz, until very recently our Capital Facilities Planner, but who is now our special OP's Special Assistant to the Chief of Staff, uh, she supported the district in uh, planning and budgeting for civic infrastructure and facilities, promoting cross-agency collaboration, data-driven decision-making, and interdisciplinary approaches. Prior to joining DC, the DC Office of Planning, Jordan managed data analysis and visualization on advocacy reports and provided technical assistance to clients across the U.S. as a research analysis for Smart Growth America focusing on land use, economic development, and transportation issues. So now that we've completed introductions, um, we are going to switch to looking uh, to, uh, at our presentation. Um, in terms of what we'll be talking about for today's session, we have covered introductions. Um, uh, the context uh, is the, is the dis of the district's approach to planning for civic infrastructure and facilities includes the, op the Office of Planning's recent changes to the comprehensive plan that encourage more interagency coordination. We'll then talk about OP's Civic Infrastructure and Facilities Initiative, also known as SciFi, uh, and we'll be using that acronym uh, a lot, uh, which brings together agencies from across the district to collaborate on planning efforts, share best practices, and identify opportunities for coordination. Finally, we will hear from the Department of Parks and Recreation about its ongoing ready to play master plan update and how the sci-fi group has helped to support the plan's de development. And then uh, we will definitely have some time for a moderated discussion that I will lead by asking questions of the panelists. Next slide, please. So let's start off by talking about what do we mean by civic infrastructure? 
There are many definitions of civic infrastructure, but we really like to use this one uh, from a report uh, by the William Penn Foundation. And that is that civic infrastructure is a city's public spaces and civic assets collection of physical sites and buildings, as well as the social processes and cultural pra practices animating those places. Public spaces and civic assets can include parks and recreation facilities, schools, libraries, streets, and sidewalks, and more. I'd like to note that this is a broader definition than infrastructure, which traditionally focuses on water, so sewer systems, roads, etc. The and in addition, the William Penn Foundation's definition speaks to the activation of spaces and the experiences of people. Next slide. So the district's facilities planning process. So we, I, I wanna start off by recognizing that capital planning and investments are critical to how we manage and leverage growth in changing cities and jurisdictions. The district's capital improvement plan is also a vital tool for implementation of our comprehensive plan and master facilities plan. So starting on the left of the slide, I'm gonna run through key planning efforts that led up to and inform spending on civic infrastructure and facilities. So first off, the district's comprehensive plan includes various elements that speak directly to infrastructure, including the transportation, infrastructure and community services and facilities element. Additionally, the district's home act requires that the comprehensive plan and CIP be linked and ask for the mayors, the district central planning agency to submit an annual analysis of consistency between the two documents. There are several policies in the district's comp plan that discuss linkages between the comp plan and the CIP. Next, uh, to speak a little bit about the district's master facilities plans, such as plans for parks and recreation uh, facilities, libraries and educational facilities. And these plans lay out the need for capital facilities based on population served, facility conditions, and the district's policy priorities. And then as we move to the right, uh, the far right of the slide, uh, the capital improvements plan, and which is also known as the CIP, uh, which the district allocate, allocates about $8 billion over a six year period for spending on capital assets such as streets, schools, libraries, parks, recreation centers, public housing, and other types of civic infrastructure facilities. So when we look at this as a whole, by establishing the linkages between planning and budgeting for civic infrastructure and facilities and planning for land use, equity, economic development and resilience, our capital spending can help foster more inclusive outcomes. These outcomes include uh, uh, outcomes such as community health and the drivers that support it, such as education, transportation and the outdoor environment. Just to dive a little deeper on the comprehensive plan, which I mentioned on the previous slide, uh, the district recently an adopted an update to our comprehensive plan for the first time since 2011. The update focused on five ma major themes to address challenges and harness opportunities facing the district today, including equity and racial justice, housing, COVID-19 and recovery, resilience and public resources. Several policies and actions were added to the comp plan to promote coordinated long-term planning for civic facilities. For example, an action on the creation of a civic facilities plan, which is written as continue to develop and refine the district's multi-layered approach to facilities master planning so that adequate community facilities are, prided, are provided for existing residents and can be provided for new neighborhoods in DC. Another action that I'd like to highlight is co around coordination of master facilities planning. And that action speaks to improving facilities master planning processes and outcomes by coordinating facilities master planning efforts of individual agencies with public facility planning efforts. So these actions and other policies in the comp plan laid the groundwork for interagency coordination through, I, through OPs, Civic Infrastructure and Facilities Initiative, also known as SciFi, which we will hear more about in the next section. But first, I'm gonna hand it over to Rogelio Flores, who will give us background on OP's approach to updating the civic infrastructure language in the comp plan. Uh, thank you, Sakina. So uh, taking a step back for a minute, uh, OP has started using systems thinking in the way that we plan our city uh, by using what, what, what is called a systems lens, um, systems that address the built and natural environments, as well as human activities within those environments. 
you can see on this slide that systems include things like civic infrastructure, schools, parks, libraries, and so forth, transportation systems, uh, the economy, sociocultural uh, systems as well. Um, and uh, as you may imagine, these systems have uh, heavily overlapping and interrelated variables. Think of your daily experience in a city, the manner in which you live, work, play, and move within the city presents a translation across these systems and the variables that underlie each of these systems. For example, things like passenger demand on the bus that you ride, real estate variables for the office building in which you work, sizing variables for the park or library you visit on your way home, and so forth. Importantly, systems can have distinct characteristics at different scales. As we zoom out from the very granular individual daily experience, to the experience of multiple uh, individuals at the block, the corridor level, then the citywide scale and beyond. Uh, so on this grid, you can see the intersection of systems and scales as a framework that has helped OP to help shape and inform our thinking as we updated the comprehensive plan. Um, specifically, it helped, really helped to illuminate key relationships among variables for systems at different scales and helped us develop policies that can help influence those variables and their outcomes uh, in a manner that advances key policy objectives. Uh, we're using this approach to better connect household dynamics and land use characteristics to the entire life cycle of projects from uh, citywide strategic planning to meet facility needs, to facility master plans, the design of specific projects and their deployment and implementation. We'll learn a little bit more about this from Nick and Jordan a little later in the presentation. Um, importantly, this system scales approach uh, has helped us ensure that equity and specifically racial equity has been interwoven throughout our work, including through a racial equity crosswalk uh, that is included in the comp plan. Next slide. Okay, so the, uh, this, this slide shows the household and facilities growth model at a very conceptual level. Uh, it is a systems-based growth model. And here you can see the, how we map out relationships among key variables uh, for the effects of growth on demand for capital facility space and investments. Uh, so you can see here that we start with jobs as a leading driver of household growth. More households add more demand for housing, uh, which then places demand on land and facilities, while at the same time creating new fiscal revenue sources that can be invested in those capital facilities. Uh, and together with uh, housing production and capital facilities, uh, can contribute to attracting more jobs and more uh, more employers to the district, therefore uh, completing the life cycle, uh, the growth life cycle. Fortunately, in the district, the cycle has been a in a very positive feedback loop over the past 20 years, and we have experienced significant growth uh, accompanied by significant investment in capital facilities. Nick and Jordan will speak more about how we look at land use changes and household dynamics uh, as we plan for um, capacity and uh, utilization and demand for facilities as the city grows. Um, so I turn it back over to Jordan. Thanks for Helio. So now I'm gonna give you all an overview of how the new policies from the comprehensive plan help to inform OP's work on our new civic infrastructure and facilities initiative, which Sakina mentioned has a fun acronym, we call it SciFi. So the mission of SciFi is to achieve a more coordinated, anticipatory, and data-driven approach for near and long-range civic infrastructure and facilities planning in the district, per the new policies and actions included in the comp plan that Sakina and Rogelio discussed. So a key component of this initiative is the SciFi Interagency Working Group, which meets regularly to coordinate on the planning efforts of various member agencies, as well as identify opportunities for interagency coordination. So the members of the Sci-Fi Interagency Working Group include a set of large footprint agencies that own and operate land and facilities, such as the Department of Parks and Recreation. And we also have several members that we call strategy information and finance agencies, such as the Office of the Deputy Mayor for Planning and Economic Development, several budget agencies, and then we also count OP as falling within this category. So um, you can see we tried to bring together agencies with a variety of roles in facilities planning to ensure that we were capturing input at various stages of a facility's life cycle. 
So why did we feel this interagency approach was important? Um, so in the district, while agencies frequently collaborate with one another in the creation of their individual master facilities plans and in their budgeting processes, agencies' processes do typically proceed separately. So effectively, each agency is creating its own uh, master facilities plan for their assets and providing those separate plans into the district's budgeting process. So we really saw three key value adds of bringing together the sci-fi working group to strengthen linkages across these various planning efforts. Um, the first was just interagency coordination. So by bringing together everyone, um, all these different agencies, we could encourage cross-agency collaboration on MFPs and strategic planning um, that supports all agencies' work, um, sets consistent baselines and assumptions across various plans, and then also fosters um, creative solutions. Um, second, uh, we thought um, bringing everyone together uh, had the added benefit of layered expertise, so it would allow us to bring together existing data platforms and areas of expertise to help identify opportunities that would enhance facilities planning and budgeting and support existing processes. And then um, lastly, uh, OP um, sort of considers itself as having a, a long range perspective. So OP plans and data bring a long term vision to facilities planning and investments that can help the sci fi working group members think longer term than a typical um, process such as the six year CIP or master facilities plans. Um, so related to the layered expertise and long range perspective points, OP recognized that there were a variety of early stage planning um, tools that the agency could offer the sci-fi interagency working group. This slide just shows a few examples of OP products, including policies and data that bear directly on facilities planning and budgeting. So um, first, um, as we've mentioned, the comp plan and the land use guidance that is provided by its uh, generalized policy map and future land use map. Um, another really key example is growth forecasting of projected population, households, and jobs in the district. And part of this is also OP's development pipeline, which tracks residential and non-residential development and is a key input into OP's forecasting, but also helps us track development in the interim between the update of our long-range forecasts. Um, and of course, the mayor's equitable housing targets, um, which set affordable housing goals for each of the district's 10 planning areas. So ultimately, our goal um, for the initiative uh, was for the district to deliver improved returns on investment, enhance public policy impacts and outcomes, and better resident experiences by planning and integrating information and analyses of facilities across all of these individual agencies, and also by coordinating these planning efforts with land use planning and growth projections. So. Um, one of the first tasks we undertook as an interagency working group was to establish guiding principles for sci-fi to inform what the group would work on together. So these were informed through a, a variety of inputs, including best practices research on facilities planning, um, all of the updated language in the comp plan, and of course, input from all of the sci-fi working group agencies. So we ended up adopting 10 cross-cutting principles that addressed the systems that Rogelio referenced, like transportation, health, housing, resilience, et cetera. Um, so these principles also identified connections among growth forecasting, land use, and the CIP as key factors, identified the importance of metrics for measuring progress across these dimensions with a, a key focus on racial equity. And importantly, the principles also emphasized the need for sustained collaboration across agencies um, and developing solutions that can be replicated and scaled over time and for innovation through the exploration of things like co-location and shared uses and value capture. So I'll just highlight a few really key principles. Um, right now, our, our first principle was equity, inclusion, and health. Um, and sought to sort of address existing inequities, improve quality of life outcomes, center resident experiences, and create spaces that are inclusive. Um, also worth highlighting is this housing vibrancy, neighborhood vibrancy and growth principle, um, which is really uh, taking that idea of applying district tools like the comp plan, the mayor's housing goals and growth forecasting um, to uh, or enhancing how they're applied in um, facilities planning processes. 
Um, and then lastly, co-location, um, which uh, looks to leverage opportunities for partnerships, co-location, and shared uses that can maximize the utility of the district's publicly owned assets by providing more integrated services, spaces, or programs with the goal of producing a more holistic experience for district residents. So with that overview of sci-fi, I'm going to turn it over to Nick Kushner of the District's Department of Parks and Recreation, who is one of our sci-fi um, interagency working group members. Um, and he will tell us more about uh, DPR's master plan update, including how sci-fi was able to support. Thanks so much, Jordan. Um, so just to set the context, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, so just to set the context for DPR a little bit. Um, so we manage the district's fourth largest six year capital budget um, of over $325 million. Uh, we have annual allocations ranging anywhere from 70 to about $113 million. Um, our capital budget includes over 150 unique projects, um, many of which are under a million dollars, but we do have a number of large projects, 25 that uh, have, have pretty extensive scopes and are over a, a 10 million um, in their budget. We have uh, a split of our different types of projects where we have some projects that have their own budget line, like major recreation um, renovations and modernizations, and then a lot of other ones that are um, smaller, what are called pooled funds. So things like ADA improvements, small park improvements, or HVAC repair. And this is where a set amount of funds can be set aside in a pool to be distributed to different sites in need of repair. Um, and so our budget as a whole is used to modernize, renovate, and expand the large inventory you see on the right, where we have over 900 acres of green space, 68 rec centers, a number of pools, fields, splash pads, playgrounds. DPR is the, is the main operator of um, parks and recreation facilities and amenities. Um, while MPS manages more of the green space, we, we operate a lot of the, um, the actual amenities within the district. So you can go to the next slide. So the biggest initiative we've been working on over the past about year and a half uh, is the ready to play master plan. Uh, so this is our 20 year vision and plan for parks and recreation in the district. Uh, it is both a strategic plan and a master's facility plan. Um, so it's going to talk to kind of broader um, policy level strategies and goals and actions, as well as develop a capital blueprint for how we spend our investment on facilities moving forward. Um, so far, we've met with dozens of community organizations, hosted virtual meetings focused on parks and, rec parks and recreational needs across all of DC's eight wards, um, engaged thousands of residents online and in person at some safe pop-up events this summer, um, conducted a citywide survey that reached nearly 3,000 uh, residents, and we've heard an overwhelming desire for additional investment in outdoor spaces. Um, even seeing a preference for the development of new park space over uh, investment in existing indoor and aquatic facilities. Um, however, that desire is not uniform across all of the wards of DC, uh, particularly in Ward 7 and 8. We saw a lot of interest in seeing higher investment uh, than has been made historically in areas of community kitchens and arts and cultural spaces. Um, so as we continue to work on the capital blueprint, uh, which will be the, the facility plan portion of the master plan, uh, we have four goals uh, that inform the, the plan as a whole, um, and I really want to call out that first goal as a unified and equitable park system, um, which uh, you can reference back to what Jordan was just saying about the sci-fi guiding principles, um, equity being, being a core to this plan as well, um, and something that, uh, you know, looking at the system as a whole, we're not just looking at the spaces that DPR manages, but we're looking at all of the potential spaces and, and community assets and civic infrastructure uh, that could be part of what is a larger parks and recreation system in the district. So um, throughout this process, we've had uh, the good fortune um, and good timing of being the first agency to go through an MFP process uh, while sci-fi was being organized. So it's been a huge benefit to us that I'll talk through through a couple of these slides. Um, so one of the, the key ways that the sci-fi is helping form our plan is through uh, what we're calling our equity framework. So this is a data-driven approach to address inequities across our park system, uh, looking both at community-wide and site-specific data. Um, in fact, a number of recent plans in the district have included statements and a focus on equity, including the District Department of Transportation's update to its long-range multimodal transportation plan, the DC Public Library's master facilities plan, and many others. Um, the, initiatives being driven across the entire district um, from Mayor Bowser, who recently appointed her first chief equity officer, um, and also the comprehensive plan and its amendment 
uh, adopted specific language calling on each agency to address racial equity within their planning and budgeting processes. Um, in DC is not alone in this endeavor as uh, many parks and recreation agencies across the country are doing a lot of really innovative work in, in planning for um, equity in how they allocate funds in their park system. So we looked at examples from Asheville, San Diego, Vancouver, Pittsburgh, uh, just to name a few, and we're trying to um, develop and, and, and design a system that works for DC um, and data inputs that work for DC. Um, in the case of Ready to Play, uh, the, the information that we're going to be looking at is both at the community level using census information, um, level of service gaps analysis, as well as park acreage. Um, we're also going to be looking at the site-specific data to not ignore those use and programmatic needs that we see on the ground level. Um, we have facility conditions done of our sites regularly, which will tell us the state of repair. Um, and we're also integrating the public comments and engagement that we heard from our, um, our, our year long engagement process um, from ready to play as part of the waiting for how we design um, the capital budget. Um, next page. So one of the things I mentioned was these level of service standards. Um, these are key ingredients to parks and planning agencies across the country. Um, they basically give um, ratios of how well you are meeting uh, the service of different types of amenities for parks. Uh, DC has historically only had an access-based level of service, so like a, a park or a playground within a half mile of every resident, um, a pool within a, a mile or two miles. Um, they, those are useful in looking across the city as a whole to determine like nearness of access. Uh, but we know that DC is growing and growing exponentially in certain areas. And so we really wanted to use this opportunity to develop population-based level of service standards. Um, so population-based standards will give us a more direct and um, appropriate response to the growing population in denser wards and areas where we know there'll be more of a stress on our resources uh, by the growing population. Uh, so these population-based level of service standards were, uh, we, we've come to these through a very intricate kind of analysis of both looking at how well we are serving the, um, the current population based on our inventory, looking at our peers and um, the, some of the metrics that we've been able to find from other jurisdictions that have done population levels of service, um, using Office of Planning and the COG projections for the 2030 and 2040 populations of DC to look at if we didn't make any improvements in our inventory, what would our level of service uh, be at that stage? And then looking at national standards from the net, um, NRPA and the Trust for Public Land, um, also looking at what has been called for, if at anything, in other plans within the district, uh, and then weighing our community feedback that we've received from the survey, whether uh, a certain amenity was a high priority or not to develop these new levels of service, which, as I mentioned, will be factored into this, this overall equity framework. Um, you can go to the next slide, Jordan. So one of the things Jordan talked about earlier was this development pipeline data, and this has been a tremendous benefit for ready to play as we've gone through our planning process. Um, given that we're kind of in an in-between time with um, the census data being uh, kind of finalized and, and apportioned and wards being redrawn, um, the, the, the COG forecasts have, have not been updated um, that recently. And so having much more recent updates through the, the continuously tracked uh, OP development pipeline data, which will track all the new developments um, or upcoming developments over the next five to 20 years within the district and, and present unit figures for how many new units we can expect to um, come into neighborhoods around our parks has been, uh, has been a great uh, way to stay on top of the development patterns within the district. Um, so in these maps, you can see on the left, the smaller map on the left, the pink is kind of the big development uh, projects in the pipeline and the green is CPR park spaces. Uh, if you go over to the map on the right, those parks that have become red our DPR sites that will have over a thousand new units uh, are slated within the development pipeline within just a quarter mile of those parks. Um, so you can see that there's tremendous growth expected in a lot of these spaces, especially in the Southwest and Capital Riverfront area, as well as all along the Anacostia. Uh, we have Randall Recreation Center with close to 8,000 new units, uh, the Berry Farm Rec Center with another 4,300. So this helps us uh, to gauge whether the existing amenities and facilities and the sizing of those spaces are adequate, um, it, given our new level of service standards for meeting the needs of, of the growing population in these neighborhoods. You can go to the next one. So um, the new opportunities for recreation uh, and co-location uh, is a critical element that we have uh, adopted from the sci-fi um, principles. So as Jordan touched on earlier, 
the principle of co-location um, is something that we've done a lot of thinking about as an agency and also with our other agency partners as part of sci-fi. Um, in a municipality like DC, where land for expansion is at a premium, the opportunity to close service gaps across every neighborhood to meet the full needs of DC residents through collaboration with other district agencies um, seems an alluring possibility. Um, so DPR actually has currently about 15 co-located sites uh, that share facilities across us and other agencies. But on top of that, there are additional sites that sit adjacent or across the street from one another, where there's a lot of additional opportunity to kind of leverage the needs of the broader community um, within those, those government assets, that civic infrastructure that's there. Um, we saw a public desire to explore this possibility more as well within our uh, engagement as part of Ready to Play, where we received over 1,500 suggestions um, from residents on a map showing where they'd like to see new recreational improvements. A lot of this was on DPR property, but a lot was also on non-DPR property, both private and other government land. So looking at that last segment, the other government land, um, that's a critical opportunity to meet some of the service gaps that we're seeing. So um, if you look at the two maps on the right, the one um, in, with showing the red land is all the DC government land not currently owned by DPR that sits outside of a current DPR walk shed. So thinking about how can we potentially use this to leverage some investment and potential um, collaboration as we go forward in our capital budgeting process to meet some of the uh, recreational needs of residents in the development of these um, government assets in the future. And then finally, I wanted to touch on a project that's upcoming that um, deals with the resilience principle of the sci-fi working group. Um, we're very excited to partner with the Office of Planning and the sci-fi initiative. Uh, over the course of this fiscal year and the next couple of fiscal years on a study of all of our small parks and open spaces throughout the district uh, to assess both the hazard risk and the mitigation potential of these spaces. So this is a, a project that's funded by um, a federal FEMA um, hazard mitigation grant through the uh, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant Fund. Um, it will develop a tool that will be used to assess all of our over 1200 small parks, triangles and open spaces as to their uh, current risk of any kind of hazards and it, their mitigation potential or the opportunity that exists there. We're also really excited to use this, not just to look at traditional hazards like flooding and heat, um, but also looking at things like economic resilience, health, um, livability, biodiversity. And so we're gonna build this tool, we're gonna apply it across our network of parks and open spaces, and then we're gonna develop some design typologies um, across these spaces to, to develop um, some, some improvements that we can utilize to better meet the resilience needs of the neighborhoods around these small parks. Um, and so with that, I will turn it back over to Sakina, uh, who's gonna walk us through a Q&A session. Great, thank you, Nick. And thank you, our panelists, for providing a lot of information uh, that speaks to different types of planning, so comprehensive planning, master planning, and infrastructure, as well as different scales, including systems, uh, citywide scales, neighborhood, and site-specific uh, site projects. So I'm going to now um, uh, facilitate a discussion. I think we have um, uh, about 25 minutes, uh, and I hope that the discussion will confirm some key points that our panelists presented on because it was a lot of content. Uh, and I also hope that we can dig a little deeper on some items such as processes, outcomes, equity, and innovation. So uh, my first question to the panel was, I'd like to probe a little more on why the new approaches to capital planning and, and civic infrastructure planning are needed. Uh, yes, Sakina. So um, I think from my perspective, uh, and at a really high level, uh, a, a, a review of literature on the subject of connecting CIPs, capital budgeting to land use, uh, reveal that really there's, there's very few cities uh, currently that really do uh, strengthen those links between those uh, important um, components. Uh, of overall city planning processes. And, uh, and in many ways, uh, the literature has, has pointed to establishing and bolstering those links as being just as important as the zoning code and zoning writ large in terms of furthering and being a really important um, city planning tool. 
uh, for DC, in DC, the CIP, uh, our six year capital improvements program uh, represents about uh, $8 billion, uh, which is about one to one and a quarter billion dollars annually in direct public investment into our physical assets and environment. So, you know, strengthening the links between the CIP and land use variables um, helps our city to illuminate and capture policy impacts that we would otherwise miss, uh, including leveraging and bolstering things like value capture, co-location, and shared uses. Uh, many cities could um, uh, uh, enhance how they can capture those benefits as well uh, with this innovative approach. Yep, and just kind of building off a little bit more about why we thought new approaches were needed. I think a lot of what the, our updates to the comprehensive plan tried to recognize is that the district agencies that plan for, fund, and operate capital facilities all have robust planning approaches and processes. So every agency is collecting data on its facilities' needs and planning for how its facilities are going to serve um, uh, populations, but what the comp plan really recognized was a, uh, the need for a new approach to coordinate across these different planning efforts. So, for example, like what can two agencies that each plan for different facilities types learn from one another and each other's processes, and how can we enhance connections with OP's longer range and area planning efforts and facilities planning efforts. So that's kind of why we created that sci-fi working group so that agencies could come together, discuss their existing approaches, and work together on a coordinated approach to planning for civic infrastructure and facilities. Great, thank you. So, so we've touched on a little on the why. I'd now like to switch to the how in terms of, let's discuss a little bit more how we got here, including um, the update of the comprehensive plan, uh, sci-fi and massive facilities planning. So Rahelio, if you wanna take a stab at this first, but I'd, I'd like to hear from, from all panelists as part of this question. Sure. I mean, I think I can start off on the process uh, portion of the equation. Obviously, process and outcomes uh, are, are really important. Uh, so in terms of process, you know, for, for me, when I first joined the D.C. Office of Planning, uh, I was charged with rapidly initiating and cultivating relationships with about 40 different agencies uh, that touch on the comp plan. And the reason there's so many agencies is that we need to remember that D.C., we're a city accounting estate, uh, and our comp plan, therefore, operates across all those levels. Um, so, uh, you know, I, uh, OP was able to innovate that process by really quickly, and I mean, very quickly developing the value proposition for partner agencies, you know, what is in it for them, uh, which in large part hinged on Compliance ability to voice and elevate policies that are important to them, uh, and for them to therefore more easily, I think, build support and attain capital funding for projects. And second of all, um, OP's engagement approach in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of process, uh, we took a very strategic, surgically focused approach that zoomed in on individual agency style, tone, and needs uh, so that we would really uh, sharpen uh, our, our convenings with them. And so, for example, the needs of the DC Water Authority are very different than those, for example, of DC public schools. And, uh, and so we were very, very attuned uh, to shaping agendas and being very surgical. Uh, on our approach. Uh, so the process was very successful. We achieved a lot of momentum on the comp plan and we continue to benefit really significantly from the uh, distinct expertise from the very large range of participating agencies. Um, so I turn it over to Jordan. Yeah, so I, I'm happy to sort of build off that the process point and talk a little bit of, about outcomes in terms of what was included in the comp plan based on all of that agency um, feedback and participation. So one of the things I think is important to highlight is um, in the community services and facilities element, we added a whole new section on health. And I think this really speaks to how we tried to integrate our cross systems approach into the comp plan. And it was really informed by DC Health's 2018 Health Equity Report, um, which you recognized how the key drivers of community health, like for example, education or outdoor environment, account for a considerable portion of health and life outcomes. So that cross systems planning um, recognizes that public assets like libraries, parks, and schools have a really key role to play in strengthening those key drivers. So I think in that way, that's a good example of um, how we took input from a specific agency and really use that to inform how we updated the comp plan. 
Um, additionally, I, I already spoke to this. There's there's a lot of additions to the comp plan about interagency coordination, but one I think that's important to highlight um, that Nick was just talking about is um, co-location. So how do we use um, uh, publicly owned sites um, to support a combination of public public or public and private uses? So the sci-fi group, I think based on all of that agency discussion that went into updating the comp plan has sort of been continuing that discussion on how we work together to maximize uh, public benefits of public property, be it by like saving land or delivering services in a more holistic manner. So I think those are kind of two very specific outcomes um, in terms of what was included in the comp plan based off of that agency input. Yeah, and I'll just jump in on the ready to play process specifically. So the prior to ready to play, the last time DPR had really undertaken any kind of comprehensive long range parks and recreation master planning was in 2013 under an initiative called Play DC. Um, and while that initiative was really successful in identifying a number of capital projects and engaging residents, um, there was never a final long range plan that was adopted from that. And so we haven't kind of had a document to take to council and other decision makers saying this is our plan, this is are the policies within it. Um, and, and so that's, that's a really critical tool to have um, when you're dealing with budget discussions. Um, thus the need to develop uh, this plan has been at the forefront of DPR for a while. Um, as I mentioned, those, those, those capital projects that were identified through Play DC um, were able to get us uh, a few years down the road uh, in having really informed and, and vetted capital project planning, but we've kind of reached the end of that list. Um, and so there's, there's a critical need to really develop the next couple decades of where we're gonna spend our capital funds moving forward. Um, and as the kind of internal conversations were happening for Ready to Play, we knew that Office of Planning was going through its comprehensive plan update. And so we worked closely with Rogelio, Sakina, Jordan, and others at the Office of Planning to ensure that uh, DPR was at the table uh, during the parks, recreation, and open space element drafting, which has the most kind of policies, broad policies that would interact with the Ready to Play Master Plan, um, just to ensure that uh, both plans would be in alignment with what we were thinking for Ready to Play, that we wouldn't be hamstrung by anything that would be in the comprehensive plan, and that we could even add language to the comprehensive plan in support of developing this new master's facilities plan for Ready to Play. Um, and so uh, after Sci-Fi was formed, it was just great timing um, to be the first uh, plan to be able to, to partner with this interagency group to go through our planning effort and to be informed by all the data sharing and collaboration um, and, uh, and, and learning from all the, the more recently released master facilities plans like the Deputy Mayor for Education and the DC Public Libraries that we'd, we've been able to gain from as part of the sci-fi process. So speaking of master facilities plans, um, I, would, I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on how the comprehensive plan and master facility plans are linked to the budget process and also how has sci-fi helped to enhance that connection? So I think I'd like to pose uh, that question to Jordan uh, and Nick. Yep, so I can start with the comp plan. So in the comp plan, um, there are several policies to strengthen the links between the comp plan and the CIP. So Sakina did mention um, that the district's Home Rule Act does require the comp plan and the CIP to be linked and that the CIP has to undergo an analysis to determine its consistency with the comp plan. So the update of the comp plan meant that we had to consider how to update the policy guidance that informs CIP formulation to ensure that we had the new policies and actions of the comp plan reflected. And this was very important because all of those uh, five major themes that Sakina went through, like equity and racial justice, housing, resilience, COVID-19 and recovery, we wanted to make sure all of that language and more that was included in the comp plan update was reflected in the policy guidance that goes into the CIP process. So the sci-fi group was really helpful in streamlining this process to update that guidance. Um, essentially, we had an already collected group of agencies that plan for capital projects, which actually OP typically doesn't go through that because we're, we're not an agency um, that typically submits for the capital budget because our projects are typically funded in the operating budget. So it was helpful to have this group of agencies collected to sort of help us think through how to distill comp plan policy policy guidance in a way that could be really useful for capital agencies. So, um, you know, we were really um, happy about how the agencies were able to work together and we see this is a really key area for um, collaboration in the future. Yeah, and really the, the core intention of Ready to Play and of other master facilities plans is to drive our capital budget requests 
uh, right? Our director uh, often refers to Ready to Play as our North Star of how and where we're gonna invest our funds moving forward. Um, it also helps provide the justification for those decisions. So through the data analysis that we do and the public engagement, which is, is really critical um, that we do to strengthen the request as we put it uh, both to the mayor's office and also before council, right? Um, and then one of the greatest difficulties uh, as I've kind of alluded to earlier of not having a master facilities plan is that you have no public vetting of the decisions that you're that you're proposing uh, for for decision makers to make? Um, it's, there's no data informed long range document to say this is why we're putting forward this particular request. Here's the need. Here's how it was weighted against other requests and why we need it now. Here's what uh, public residents, which are councils constituents, have said about the need for this space. Um, and then, as Jordan mentioned, when we submit our budget requests, we have to. Um, uh, fill out forms showing how they are uh, tied to the comprehensive plan of those different elements that we talked about earlier. And so the two are intricately linked in that way. Um, and then MFPs as a whole uh, essentially act as the more granular sector specific action plans to support these broader kind of more far reaching citywide policies that the comp plan adopts. Great, thank you. So my next question is a, is a bit of a different question. Um, and it relates back to the title of our session, which includes the term innovative. And some would argue that that term is overused. Um, so I would like to probe a little on why it is relevant here. Why, would we, why, why are we making the case that these approaches and methods are innovative solutions um, to, to um, you know, some of the, the issues or the processes that previously existed. So um, I'm gonna, I think I'll throw this back to, to both Jordan and Nick to answer. Thank you. Yep, so um, I think what's important to note when we talk about this as being an innovative approach is that district agencies have a really long history of innovative planning, design, and budgeting for public facilities. I could give a ton of examples of that. I think one of the key ones is thinking about, you know, the design excellence of our public facilities, but I think very important to note that each of the individual agencies were, are already taking innovative approaches, but I think I'll just echo my previous point that I think that the key innovative piece here is really that cross systems approach that Rogelio introduced to us. So sort of how are we uh, like creating plans that consider the interactions between systems and scales within the city? And then how does this coordination occur across various stages of a, of a facility's life cycle? So from master plans to, to strategic plans, to the annual budget cycles, to the comp plan, and then how are we ensuring that issues and topics that every agency and the whole district is facing, like racial equity and resilience, and then also planning tools like land use, population growth, and other metrics are being consistently applied and fed into all of these different um, processes that different agencies are taking. So I think, in short, cr the cross-systems system systems approach is really the innovative piece. Yeah, I think the innovative aspect of sci-fi is really the recognition and the action upon the, the recognition that civic infrastructure is not static and it's not siloed, right? And how the public interacts with these different civic assets and infrastructure and how they use it. So we saw during the pandemic, right? Public space used for recreation, all kinds of spaces that weren't typically used for recreation became opened up. Alleys, streets, sidewalks, parking lots, um, right? People would go wherever they could to kind of get that safe six feet away from other people and be able to recreate still. Um, we also continue to see the impact of that, um, utilizing our streets for the streetery program that we have in DC, right? Um, and all of the slow streets and the open streets that have taken hold across the country uh, as part of the pandemic. So we, we've really seen a focus on utilizing the full infrastructure of the civic commons um, for people to, to utilize in the way that meets their needs. Um, in Ready to Play, we also saw a focus on designing each rec center um, to meet the unique needs of the community. So uh, there's really been a, an evolution in thinking in parks and rec agencies across the country uh, to offer a broader range of civic services to residents that meet what they're hearing from that community. So as I mentioned um, earlier, the residents in Ward 7 and 8 have called for additional um, community kitchens and arts and cultural spaces. So offering more culinary classes and entrepreneurship opportunities out of some of our rec centers, um, things like job training, We've also seen during the pandemic, the response, the emergency response um, use of our centers has been tremendous. They've acted as both um, pandemic uh, meal distribution sites, uh, testing sites when we were doing testing of everybody, and then 
um, vaccination clinics once we once we got the vaccine. Even just last week, Mayor Bowser kicked off her five to eleven year old vaccine pop up clinics at a DPR rec center. So they continue to be used um, in this really um, innovative way as, as just a civic asset that is utilized uh, for the needs of the community. Well, thank you both. I, I hope that we have made the case for why this is this is innovative, both in terms of the cross systems approach, as well as thinking about um, some of our, our master planning and, and project specific efforts. So, um, so now we're going to focus a little bit more on the civic infrastructure and facilities initiative um, that Jordan had presented on earlier. Um, and I want to focus a little bit more on the guiding principles and how they've been helpful to OP, OPs and DPR's planning efforts. Yeah, so I'll jump in here first. I, I think I, I mentioned a, a couple of these already in my presentation, but um, a couple more that I'll throw out uh, just to highlight our metrics. Uh, so we're looking at once we are able to publish and release the final plan of Ready to Play, developing a, a public dashboard to track both implementation of our strategies, but also at a broader level to use census data and population projections and update um, the data that we're sharing regularly to show the state of our parks and recreation system in DC, right? So, so getting that focus on metrics and developing um, kind of comprehensive metrics that are publicly accessible that can go to inform how we're doing in our agency's mission, but also can be utilized by other agencies as well. Um, another principle I'll touch on is design excellence. So we're striving to go above and beyond the lead building requirements dictated in the DC code, uh, calling for enhanced sustainability and resilience measures. We're looking into designing rec centers to act as resilience hubs, designing park infrastructure and play equipment to be floodable, um, integrating biophilic design into our new rec centers, um, and then calling for universal design of spaces as opposed to the bare minimum of ADA accessibility. Um, DPR is also currently partnering with OP and our sister agency, the Department of General Services, who's really led the way in developing a new pilot DC specific design excellence program, um, which includes more intricate design review and assessment of some of our rec center spaces. And so we're piloting that program on a couple of our upcoming redesigns. Yeah, and I, I think all great examples, I think taking a quick step back about like why the guiding principles are helpful um, to agencies, including OP, I think, is because we really started with both the, comp the comprehensive plan and policies that were included and then also input from each individual's agency's plans. So it, it's it's kind of funny how they all sort of funneled into these uh, guiding principles, you know, but I just, I think it's important to note that like the principles didn't come out of nowhere. They came out of these previous really strong planning processes. And that was sort of really helpful in guiding their creation about what we were all gonna work on together. So a couple um, additional principles that I wanna highlight in addition to the, the ones that um, Nick mentioned that are helpful for OP specifically. I think um, first, uh, the group has been a really helpful forum for discussion about how the district government is approaching, oh my gosh, the, the lights went off in this room. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> how the um, district government has been approaching uh, the guiding principle of advancing equity, inclusion, and health in public spaces across various facilities planning processes. So I think um, Nick's example of um, how DPR has been approaching its equity framework in Ready to Play um, is just one example of that, but we've sort of had this forum for discussion about how multiple agencies are doing that. And then another thing that's been really helpful for OP is just talking about individual plans, um, how plans for individual facilities and opportunities for co-location are, are supporting policy objectives or can support policy objectives like the mayor's housing goals or goals from specific small area planning processes. So I think those are two additional um, uh, principles to highlight. Great, thank you. So unfortunately, we have, we are now at our last question. Um, and this is going to be more of a rapid fire um, response or question and response for each of you. And then I will do a very quick summary. So what I would like us to close out on is each of you speaking to what does success look like for sci-fi and coordinated master facility planning efforts? So 
I'll start just because we were just talking about the guiding principles to say that when we established sci-fi's guiding principles, we really intentionally included our, our final principle to utilize sci-fi to sustain and enhance successful processes and outcomes. So I think OP's goal for this initiative has always been to sort of to continue and to encourage collaboration across district agencies on an ongoing basis in a way that strengthens all of our agency's work. Um, so success to me is sort of uh, the group working together to strengthen and um, operationalize connections at all stages of the facilities planning process, um, from the comp plan and early stage planning tools to MFPs, uh, to across MFPs, and then into the budget process. Um, I also think that um, success is ensuring that these connections that we're establishing is helping the district enhance the residents' experience of civic facilities and infrastructure by promoting some of these key sci-fi guiding principles like equity, inclusion, accessibility, design excellence, or resilience. So that is my thought. Rahelia, I'll turn it over to you. Sure. Thank you, Jordan. And I think, you know, building on, on what you just mentioned, Jordan, uh, I think through our experience with sci-fi, Sakina, um, I think, you know, framing use cases that really address your city's priorities and building on them incrementally. So again, I go back to the process question. Uh, it's very important to just take one step at a time. You know, it's not it's not all or nothing. And, uh, you know, it is it has been a very ambitious endeavor, I think, for us for sci fi. Uh, but I think you can take sort of incremental uh, approaches. And I do want to emphasize the importance of process. And so to me, success looks um, the way success looks is uh, through an ongoing, really active and focused strategic dialogue among the key agencies and keeping that dialogue moving forward is really critical for making this work a reality. Um, also recognizing that the CIP, comprehensive plans, facility master plans, all these things are living documents, even though they're really pretty, you know, uh, uh, end products as well, uh, that we do need to recognize that these are sort of organisms that are living, uh, living organisms and, uh, and therefore keeping an active dialogue and implementation uh, throughout um, their life cycles is really important. Uh, so move, moving over to Nick on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think you said it really well there, Rogelio. Uh, Sci-Fi has just been critical in bringing the different agencies together uh, to compare notes, ensure plans are cohesive and complementary. Um, providing opportunities for enhanced synergy, um, efficiencies, uh, potential cost savings to the district from this collaboration. Um, you know, when you when you go before the mayor or the council and you present your master facilities plan, if you've done your plan as an agency, that's powerful. You've done a lot of thinking and data analysis, but taking uh, a plan to the decision makers of the of the government that has integrated and thought through and, and discussed the master facility needs and plans of all of the other capital planning agencies as well, um, schools, libraries, uh, other facility owning agencies, um, that, that can really go a long way to um, using the leverage of that support to really get that plan implemented. Um, and I think what that looks like uh, for residents on the ground is a much more cohesive, thoughtful, seamless, non-disruptive experience um, in the overall project planning, design, and construction um, of DC's facilities and its civic infrastructure um, in their neighborhoods and their backyard so that people aren't coming back two or three times with an engagement process on adjacent pieces of land. It's all kind of done um, collectively and cohesively and timed out appropriately. Um, so I, I'll, I'll send it back to you, Sakina, for closing thoughts. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, this I just want to thank our panelists. This has been so much information that we've covered, and I hope it's useful for the audience. Um, just to recap a couple of the key points, um, you know, the very definition of civic infrastructure is, is much broader than traditional infrastructure. So I think that's an important starting point for the conversation. And uh, civic infrastructure includes civic assets such as parks and libraries and recreation centers, but also activation and resident experience. Uh, we also talked about capital planning. Uh, that really was the main focus of our, of our discussion uh, and how capital planning and investments are critical to how we manage and leverage growth in changing cities and jurisdictions. We talked about the comprehensive plan and how it provides a platform for a more coordinate, coordinated approach to master facilities planning. Um, we heard a lot about uh, sci-fi, uh, including its guiding principles, uh, which incorporate equity and resiliency. And those guiding principles are being applied uh, to master facilities planning efforts, such as uh, uh, what we heard from Nick regarding DPR's efforts. 
And the layering and application of these initiatives amounts to an innovative approach. I did probe that a little, like are we being innovative? Uh, to, so an in, in, innovative approach towards civic infrastructure, capital planning and investments, and uh, really how an in innovation in terms of how we manage across assets, we recognize that the assets are not siloed or static. And we think about process as well as outcomes and, key, uh, and uh, as well as outcomes. Um, and it's through these kind of cross systems coordinated approaches and by linking planning to the capital budget that we can foster equity and lead to more inclusive outcomes uh, that can then improve residents' access to services as well as resident experience and quality of life. So um, uh, please uh, go back and look at the, the, the entire presentation because there's a lot of good content in there. Again, I would like to thank our panelists and APA and CAC for hosting this panel. And I would encourage the audience uh, to reach, not only to look, to, to look at the deck uh, and look at it a few times, um, but to also reach out with any follow-up questions. So thank you. Thank you, Sakina. And Nick, if you just wanna show the slides with our contact info, if that's possible. So again, I think Jordan is going to might or be Jordan. able to do that. Yeah, I don't have it. Oh. <laughs> well, it includes <laughs> some of our information, um, but we can, uh, if if folks have questions, you can reach out either directly to us or um, to NCAC. Um, who will then fill the questions to us. So thank you again, everyone, and goodbye.